So good afternoon. Uh, I do have uh, three o'clock Eastern time. Welcome to the uh, webinar today, Winter on the Great Lakes, Ice, Evaporation, and Water Level Impacts. So my name is Mark Breederland, and uh, like all programs sponsored by Michigan Sea Grant Extension, MSU Extension, this program is open to all, and it's highlighted in our And Justice for All slide and that's provided by our federal and our uh, university partners. If you're not familiar with Michigan Sea Grant, we fund Michigan Sea Grant funds research, education, and outreach projects about the use and conservation of the Great Lakes resources, and we provide access to science-based information about Michigan's coasts and the Great Lakes. Really happy to have uh, my colleagues uh, from Michigan Sea Grant, Cindy Hudson and Geneva Langland from our communications team that are kind of, uh, they've done yeoman work on getting so many of the details for this uh, webinar together. So they are kind of working a little bit more behind the scenes today, but they've done a, a huge amount of work. Um, just a couple comments, as you probably well know, especially if you're on Lake Michigan here on or have that uh, lake as an interest. It's certainly been a, a notable last couple of years uh, on lake levels from uh, the official period of record from 1918 on. I, I've done dozens and dozens of talks and, and uh, many others across the uh, basin from the Corps of Engineers to NOAA to lots of others have done the same. And, and you know that uh, in a year ago in 2020, uh, Lake Michigan here on broke all the uh, record highs for the first eight months of the year. So it was really a notable year. So we're really glad they're down 11 to 12 inches right now from a year ago. But um, just uh, today's uh, topic is, is uh, pertinent because obviously we live in a, in a four seasons Great Lakes. And, and we know that ice can uh, either protect or harm. You know, I've a lot of times tell people it's a friend or foe. So we're certainly aware of flooding issues on uh, uh, ice jams down the St. Clair River. At these high levels, that's even exacerbated kind of from on the US side from Marine City North to uh, Port Huron area. So um, we are here today to learn a lot more about this thing called winter. This thing called winter is a comment that the real estate agent noted to my wife when we moved to Northern Michigan, there is a thing called winter. So um, we're here today to, to learn and really expand our horizons a bit on the complexity of winter in the Great Lakes. So with that, let me cover just two logistics, introduce our uh, expert speakers uh, after that. Um, on the Zoom, uh, our chat is disabled today, but the question and answer box is operating. And so there's a Q&A uh, box there that just says, you can click on that, we'll certainly be monitoring that. So um, glad, to, uh, glad to comment uh, and re respond to the questions there. Secondly, the webinar is being recorded and probably after a week or so, we're gonna be making this uh, webinar available on our Michigan Sea Grant YouTube page after we get it uh, closed captioned and a bit of editing. So I think with that, let me uh, kind of go into the meat of our program and introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Lenters. John's a native uh, Michigander from West Michigan. He studied math and physics at Hope College, and he earned a PhD at Cornell in atmospheric science. John's one of the top researchers on lake atmosphere interactions, particularly on Great Lakes evaporation. He is now anchored at the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Technological University, where he is a research scientist. John joins us from Houghton, Michigan, and thanks so much, John, for presenting today. And I'm going to get ready to uh, turn it over to you. So as much as we can, we'll try and give John a warm welcome and uh, go from there. Thanks so much, John. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Mark. I hope you can see me up there and hear me OK. And thanks to Sea Grant for hosting this uh, webinar. Um, I am here in Houghton. My background photo there is Copper Harbor during a warmer time of the year. And as much as I like that photo for my background, I am going to just stop my video while I'm giving the presentation, um, just in case we have any, any internet issues and so my audio doesn't get garbled. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I um, started here at Michigan Tech uh, last April, uh, in the midst of COVID, kind of a strange year to start a new job, but I've enjoyed my time here and great bunch of people to work with. 
Um, speaking of acknowledging folks, I, this is my acknowledgement slide at the end, but I like to put this at the beginning too, because um, a lot of effort from various groups have gone into the science that I'll be describing in my, my presentation. So I just wanted to be sure to acknowledge a number of people, people particularly Peter Blanken at CU Boulder and, and Chris Benson, Noel Hedstrom at Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, all of whom have been critical to the formation of the Great Lakes Evaporation Network. So I'll start out, um, we are talking about winter, but like Mark was saying, um, we've got a lot of interesting seasons on the Great Lakes. And I'm gonna start out by showing a slide of what I'm calling Lake Superior's interacting seasons. And they're defined here according to the meteorological definition. So summer starting um, June 1st and running through the end of August, autumn from, uh, from September 1st to end of November. Winter is December, January, February, and, and spring is March, April, May. So a bit different from the astronomical definitions, which relate more to the sun, um, solstice and, and equinox and so forth. But what's interesting about this, and I'll be focusing mostly on Lake Superior in my talk is an example lake of the Great Lakes with a, a few others thrown in at various times. But what I like about this graph, and this is what we call the mean annual cycle or the average monthly um, changes in, in water temperature, evaporation, and ice cover on Lake Superior. And you can see how there are really different seasons for each of them. The summer is the time of, of warming. And so we get a lot of sunshine and the water temperatures warm up. They peak in late summer. And then as we head into autumn, it gets to be the windy, stormy season. Air temperatures cool down and evaporation really kicks in. And so the, the reason that water temperatures cool down as rapidly as they do has a lot to do with evaporation picking up. And so they're very interrelated. And then evaporation peaks around um, December for Lake Superior, quite a bit earlier for Lake Erie because it's shallower. But all that peak evaporation in December is really what helps contribute to then the ice cover that forms around that time and then builds up to maximize in late February into early March. So we're now right here, right at the transition between winter and spring. And that's typically when we see maximum ice cover on the Great Lakes and then they begin to decline as um, air temperatures warm up and we get more daylight. So just a, an introductory slide about those different seasons. I will mention that you know, Lake Superior and the other lakes have very dynamic ice cover. This is an image from a webcam on top of um, Standard Rock Lighthouse. This is from two years ago um, in cooperation with folks at Superior Watershed Partnership that own the lighthouse. And this is a, a webcam that shows an image at three o'clock in the afternoon and, and here's five o'clock. So two hours later, you know, it looks very different. The ice has moved on and you can see a lot of broken up patches of ice um, you sometimes hear that, you know, Lake Superior can get close to 100% ice cover, but it's really never truly 100% because there's always some open water somewhere. It's very dynamic. It's moving around um, and breaking up. So wind plays a big role. Another example, the dynamic ice cover, this was the infamous polar vortex winter of 2013-14. So this is February 2014, an image from NASA MODIS. And you can see uh, most of the shore fast or land fast ice along the edge of the shoreline there. Um, but then big gaps as the wind has blown some of the ice northward, um, breaks out, you know, near Standard Rock and other places. So even during the, what we consider the, the most recent, you know, highest ice cover in our recent memory, there's a lot of breaks in the ice. Then again, just a couple degrees Celsius of warmer temperatures, air temperatures in the winter can lead to something like this. So this is February, 2012. Another example of Lake Superior's dynamic ice cover and, and the Great Lakes as a whole, just a couple degrees of temperature difference in the winter can lead to a year when you have lots of ice and you have very little ice. And so in this year, it was pretty much just, um, you know, in the shores um, of the Northern regions up by Thunder Bay and some of the, some parts near the Apostle Islands and elsewhere. As we know, normal is changing. I'm not gonna talk a lot about climate change um, just in the interest of time today, but it's important to note that in 97, 98, there was a big step change where Lake Superior went from having on average 82% ice cover now down to 34% ice cover. And 
Um, it's not restricted to just Lake Superior, but all the Great Lakes are seeing a reduction in ice cover. So it's important to remember that we live now in a time period where it's very different from, for example, when I was a kid growing up in Holland, Michigan, the winters of 78, 79 were, were you know, they still stick in my memory as being close to the polar vortex year of 2014. All right, so just a kind of uh, humorous interlude. This is a slide that I've seen to now include in all my talks, <laughs> partly because of the humor. Um, this is Donald Rumsfeld, a former um, Secretary of Defense for the US that was known for very funny quotes, some of them serious, some of them not so serious. But this is one that I actually saw at a scientific conference in Italy, and it was the concluding slide, and it struck me it's funny, and so I took a photo, and then I read it again later, and I was like, you know what, this actually makes a lot of sense for scientists. There are things we know, we know, there are things that we know we don't know, and there are also unknowns, which are things we don't know we don't know. So I, I put this up here partly to, to make the point that I'm going to try to make clear the things that we know we know about the science of the Great Lakes, but also be clear about what we don't know. All right, so this is a, a, just a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about, evaporation, ice cover, and water level implications, uh, broken up a bit into different uh, sections. What I'll refer to here in a moment is the invisible elephant, which is evaporation. I'll talk a little bit about the Great Lakes Evaporation Network. Evaporation physics, a, a pretty brief introduction. Um, the role of ice, which is very complicated and then water level implications related to water budgets and, and the spring and summer outlooks for this year. So evaporation, the, the invisible elephant, why do I call it that? Well, it, to a large extent, it is invisible. It's a river of water vapor into the air, largely unseen, except in examples like this, where you can see streamers coming off the Great Lakes. This is not the evaporation really, this is the condensation that forms from that evaporation. So it's evidence that evaporation is occurring on the Great Lakes. But unless we see these lake effect clouds, we really largely don't see it. It's sparsely measured as I'll show in a moment. It's, it's counterintuitive and often misunderstood, which I'll hopefully explain with the physics. It is the elephant in the room a lot of times when we talk about the Great Lakes water balance because it's a large component of that balance. It also is a, a strong um, cooling process. And so it removes heat from the Great Lakes. It affects the temperature in a big way. And it's also increasing due to climate change. So why study evaporation then? And this hits on some of those points. And one is it's very large. So this is the Lake Superior water balance, similar to what I showed previously. This is a long-term um, <clears throat> mean annual cycle going from June to May. And for Lake Superior, I've broken it out into um, the, the, some of the main components, precipitation, evaporation over the, this is precipitation, um, I believe, over the lake, evaporation over the lake, and then runoff into the lake from rivers and streams. Those are the three big ones. There's also some diversions into the lake that are, are small. I haven't shown the outflow from the St. Mary's River because it's, it's large, but mostly flat, um, removes a lot of the water from the, from the lake. But what's important here, and I put the units here both in, in fluxes of water and centimeters per month, um, but also the number of Niagara Falls. So if you turn that centimeters per month into a volume, evaporation at its peak in December is, is giving off two Niagara Falls of water into the sky. It, it's that kind of rate, that kind of amount. So it's a very large loss of water um, comparable to what's coming out of the St. Mary's River. And the other thing is you notice it varies significantly seasonally. So it goes up and down much more than precipitation and runoff. And so, you know, you, you've probably noticed if you live along the Great Lakes or you've seen the charts, so they go up and down about a foot or more every year, just, just seasonally. And that is largely a reflection of evaporation. That's evaporation doing that. Now there's a spring runoff peak from snowmelt that also contributes to that quite a bit, but the predominant one is evaporation. A few other things I already mentioned, it affects water temperature. It's the cooling down period um, in the summertime and, and autumn and into the winter. So evaporation is, is causing that cooling. This is water temperature spatially on the lake. So you can imagine that temperature also affects evaporation. So you'd expect higher evaporation rates in warmer parts of the lake than in colder parts of the lake. So it's important in that respect. 
it's changing. This is a, an earlier plot from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory's um, hydroclimate dashboard, which shows evaporation from Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie um, from the early 1950s to about 2014. And you can see a, an upward trend in their simulated evaporation rates. Uh, because of that, partly, and you know, some years we have an early start to the evaporation season, and back in 2012 that did occur. We had a really warm March and um, early stratification on the lake that led to early evaporation and a decline in water levels on Lake Michigan Huron, um, flirting with the record lows that year. Hard to believe that that was just nine years ago, but you know, this this is what it was back in 2012, and now we're back up last year to record high levels. And then here's another really important thing. It's it's really um, understudied. It's it's sparsely measured. These are uh, a paper from 2000 that that showed the, a map of rain gauges in the Great Lakes Basin, stream gauges in the Great Lakes Basin, and evaporation gauges in the Great Lakes Basin. And I use the word evaporation gauges loosely because that's a kind of a poor term for what's really needed to measure evaporation. But um, you're not not seeing dots on this map incorrectly. There is actually no data on this map. There were no evaporation gauges in 2000. Even the stream gauges and, and rain gauges, you can see there's big gaps throughout this um, basin. So it's evaporation that really had the big gap. So back in um, about 2011, 2012, we started forming a, a Great Lakes Evaporation Network and got some initial funding from GLISA, the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Center. Um, and they, they still have this report on their website. There's a link here that describes some of the preliminary results from that evaporation network. These are what some of the stations look like. These are the first two sites on the Great Lakes, both on Lake Superior, um, one that I installed at Granite Island in cooperation with Northern Michigan University and the University of Nebraska when I was there. And then uh, Standard Rock Lighthouse, which um, was part of an international Upper Great Lakes study. And on top of these lighthouses, we have weather station, oh, not on the lighthouse at Granite Islands, and on top of the bell tower, but on top of Standard Rock, there is a, a weather station that looks like this. Um, it's, it's basically a weather station on steroids. It's just looking back towards Marquette, Presque Isle off there in the distance. Um, some basic weather instruments like air temperature and relative humidity, but also some more sophisticated instruments that make high frequency measurements of water vapor, CO2, air temperature and um, vertical wind speed at, at 10 hertz, so 10 times per second. And we use what's known as the eddy covariance method to calculate evaporation from the lake based on fluctuations in wind. When, when you get an eddy of wind, oftentimes you get a slight variation in, in uh, air temperature and, and humidity that you can then correlate to calculate um, what the evaporation rate is. We get some real-time data and imagery from some of these sites. This is Granite Island on a variety of different days over the year, mostly in the winter time here, just to give you a, a sense of what winter looks like from an island that's six and a half miles offshore. Um, sometimes it looks like a basic ice ball, and other times you get some interesting um, fog coming off the lake, start of lake effect snow, some ice forming here. Um, this is what the data looks like coming in real time. This is actually uh, about as real time as we can get. This is a snapshot I took about 45 minutes ago. And you can see this is actually heat fluxes. This is evaporation and what's known as sensible heat flux. We had a, um, a spell where we had ice cover and then ice cover moved out and we had some cold um, temperatures and we got a spike in evaporation a few days ago. And now we're back to somewhat lower values. Um, again, this is standard rock. There's a webcam up there that gives some imagery from that site, we've been growing the network. This started um, in 2009. Peter Blanken put some sites out on northern Lake Michigan and Huron at White Shoal and Spectacle Reef Lighthouse. And those are interesting sites because White Shoal tends to get a, quite a bit of ice cover, whereas Spectacle Reef doesn't. And so you can do an interesting contrast with very similar meteorology, but very different ice conditions to see how that affects evaporation. Um, They've also done some installations. This is uh, um, Chris Spencer did an installation on, on a ship that Environment Canada runs um, to make similar measurements at the bow of the ship. Um, Peter Blanken has done this on the Whitefish Bay in cooperation with um, Canada Steamship Lines. So we're, we're trying to, to expand the network a bit by doing things on boats so that we can 
get beyond what we're just measuring at fixed lighthouses and, and try to get more spatial definition on the Great Lakes. So this is the current Glen network. Some of these sites are now operated by the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab in Ann Arbor. Um, there is a newish site out at Simcoe Island, um, Nine Mile Point, I believe it's actually called on, on Lake Ontario, and that's with Environment Canada as well. All right, so that's um, just some background on evaporation, why it's important, and the evaporation network. Now I'll talk a little bit more about the science, um, the physics of evaporation, and the role of ice. So I'm putting this slide back up here to, again, just as a reminder, and it, well, it may actually show up again later in my talk, because I think it's really important to show this interaction between temperature and evaporation and ice cover. Um, they are all very interrelated, and they all affect each other in important ways. But one thing you um, often find yourself asking yourself if you're a scientist is, you know, what drives something? What causes something to happen? So what drives evaporation? Well, ultimately it's energy. Evaporation is a cooling process, just like sweating. You know, if you're outside in the summertime and you're sweating, you stay a lot cooler than if you don't sweat. Um, because of that, in order for evaporation to proceed, it requires energy to be sustained. And so in the case, and I'm going to go back here one slide and, and show you that in the case of the summertime, we're getting a lot, a lot of energy from the sun, obviously, and the sun does a lot of the, the work of heating up the lake. Um, as we get into autumn, however, we don't have as much sunlight and sun, sunlight doesn't really directly drive evaporation, but it did provide a lot of the heat in the summer that allows evaporation to proceed in fall. And so what evaporation does is says, well, I, I need energy to proceed, so I'm just gonna take it from the lake itself. The lake itself has internal energy in the form of, of uh, temperature. And so the temperatures drop as evaporation picks up. And so in the absence of other sources of energy, the lake can only do one thing and that is cool off and eventually form ice as well. Um, it's not just energy that's important though. And this is um, perhaps more important for thinking about if the lake is evaporating on a given day or not. It requires gradients and in particular it requires a, a gradient in humidity between the water and air. Um, Simply speaking, you, you generally need warm-ish water, um, and I use warm in quotes, but warm, warm water, dry air um, to produce strong evaporation. And, and you can even just say cold air because it really, the dryness of the air matters in an absolute sense, not in terms of like relative humidity, but more in terms of things like dew point or um, vapor pressure, which I'll talk about in a moment. And if air is, is really cold, it tends to be very dry in an absolute sense. The relative humidity could be high, but if it's really cold, the absolute humidity is very low. So in a very simplistic way, to get evaporation, you want the lake to be warm and the air to be cold because then it'll be dry. Um, that's not it. However, you do need a little bit of wind. Um, even a little, you know, just some amount of wind helps. The stronger the wind, the greater the evaporation. It mixes dry air down to the lake surface. It transports humid air away from the lake surface. So it essentially, you know, it basically maintains this gradient we were talking about above so that that evaporation can proceed. So here's a little bit more of the science. And this is a, a, a really important graph, sometimes referred to as the Clausius-Clapeyron relationship, but it, it uh, shows you what the saturation vapor pressure of water looks like as a function of temperature and degrees Celsius. Now, vapor pressure is, is just the partial pressure of water vapor within the air itself. Standard atmospheric pressure is around 1,000 millibars, so that would be way off this chart. So um, water vapor doesn't occupy a huge amount of that 1,000 millibars. But on the other hand, if you were to bring water to the boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius, which is way off this chart, this curve would ex exponentially increase to 1,000 millibars and your water would boil. So you can think of this as like the boiling point of water at different um, uh, pressures. So you could look up, you know, what would it take to basically boil the water at, at 1,000, to get it to 1,000 millibars and you would require 100 degrees Celsius. So um, a couple different things here. This is the curve for water. The air is often unsaturated. Um, it can be saturated, you can get 100% relative humidity, so that would be right along this line. And then um, supersaturated conditions do occasionally occur as well. 
Um, but we're typically talking about um, an air parcel that would be somewhere within this realm um, in the drier, drier zone here. So using this graph now, I'm gonna introduce something called vapor pressure deficit. And this is basically one of the ways to indicate how dry the air is. You can also use relative humidity um, to indicate that, but let's say we had a parcel of air that had an air temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, and it had um, this much vapor pressure, all right? So it, it had this amount of water vapor in the air, 13 millibars. You could figure out its dew point, which is basically the how cold would the air have to get for it to form dew, and that would be down here around 12 degrees, 13 degrees Celsius. And then um, the vapor pressure deficit would be how far down below the saturation point are you um, from its air temperature down to the actual value of, of the um, vapor pressure in the air. So you can, you can do a couple different things. You can calculate the relative humidity, which is how much vapor is in the air divided by how much it can hold, and you get about 35%. So that would be a pretty dry air parcel. The vapor pressure deficit is the difference then between if the air was saturated and if it and it in its current unsaturated state. So the vapor pressure deficit would be 24 millibars. Now, so far, I've only talk, talked about the air temperature here and the, and the dew point. So this really just tells you how dry the air is. It doesn't tell you much about the lake. And it's really the lake that matters for evaporation. So we have to add in something else here known as the vapor pressure gradient. And so what you do is you say, okay, well, what is the water temperature at the surface of the lake? And let's say in the summertime, it may be 22 degrees um, Celsius. And if you, it's saturated, right? It's a, it's a lake, so it's a body of water. So it's saturated at that point. And you can put it right on this curve, the water curve and line it up with that temperature. And you come up with a value of 25 millibars. So that difference between the saturated value at the water temperature and the unsaturated value of the air parcel, that is the gradient that I was talking about previously. That is the vapor pressure gradient between the lake and the air, and that's what matters for driving evaporation. So the bigger that difference, the bigger that gradient, the more evaporation you're gonna get. Now I picked up an example here that's maybe typical for summer, um, maybe a, a bit warmish for Lake Superior, but what happens in the autumn and the, and the, and the winter then? air temperature drops quite a bit. So this parcel ends up going somewhere way down here. Dew point goes down as well. Water temperature cools down, but not as rapidly as the air. And so then you end up getting a vapor pressure gradient that is larger as the entire system cools down. So that's, that's really why the Great Lakes evaporate more in the, in the fall and the winter than they do in the summertime. So in a nutshell, um, and that was, you know, more of the details of the science, but really in a nutshell, it's warm water, dry air, and wind, and that's what creates the highest evaporation rates. So if we look at a couple examples um, without using that chart now, think of winter as being windy, it's cold, you've got dry air, air temperature might be 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the dew point would be maybe around 5 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a pretty cold winter day, but if the lake is still open, has no ice on it, it still relatively warm. So I use the word warm in quotes here. It's cold water to us, but it's warm compared to the air. And so you get a big gradient between the water temperature and the dew point. And that just, by the way, is a very quick way for you to tell if the lake is evaporating or not. How does the water temperature compare to the dew point of the air? If there's a big difference, there's a, there's a lot of evaporation going on, assuming that there's at least some wind. In the summertime, the water temperature is quite a bit warmer. And so you might think, well, evaporation rates should go up because I've got warm water. Well, what often happens is, is the summer itself, the air temperatures gets warmer too, and it gets more humid. And so we have warm, humid air masses that sometimes in June, they're so humid that you actually get a dew point that's higher than the water temperature. Now, in this case, it's only five degrees, but sometimes we get the reverse and you can actually get condensation on the lake. And so even though the water temperatures go up, the, the humidity of the air goes up even more. So this is another way of look, looking at why, you know, why is the evaporation highest in the winter when you might think it should be highest in the summer. And, and this is partly a reflection of the, the deep lakes that we're talking about, um, especially Lake Superior. If you're talking about a shallow pond or just a puddle, um, then definitely the evaporation rates are, are higher in the summer.
Okay, so roll of ice, it's complicated. Let's take that winter example again and add some ice on top of it. So now we've got, you know, instead of a water surface that's 35 degrees Fahrenheit, we've now capped it with frozen water. So we didn't really change the substance. We just, we made it a solid, but it's still water. But the, the main difference is um, ice often will, will equilibrate with the air temperature itself, at least, you know, if it's relatively thick ice. And so let's say the air temperature is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The ice temperature then will be close to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And suddenly that gradient that we were talking about previously disappears and evaporation becomes very small. And you can actually see that on some of the um, cloud imagery. This was just uh, February 15 of this year. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, you could see some of these streamers coming across Lake Superior, but we had formed an ice bridge between Canada and Isle Royal, and there was a band of ice here. And so it actually acts, acts like a little bit of a land bridge that inhibits evaporation from the lake. And you can see that the lake effect clouds start um, now quite a bit away from shore because of the impact of that ice. So it's you can see that uh, visually in these satellite images. And then again, there are other times that ice does not cap evaporation, and that's if conditions are warm and humid. So let's say you had this image from 2012, February 2012, there's, there's very few clouds on the lake, there's very little ice on the lake, it implies that there are very few gradients. There's, it's probably relatively warm, um, humid air for, for February. And if you don't have a gradient to begin with, it doesn't matter if you cap it off with ice. It, it's still no gradient. And so ice is really only an effective cap when the conditions would otherwise be ripe for evaporation. So ice does a number of other things. And I already mentioned this capping effect um, in that it's only effective when evaporation would otherwise be strong. But what does that do now? So now let's say you cap evaporation in a, when a big strong cold front comes across the lake and now we put ice over it. Well, the ice is now preventing additional heat loss. So it's actually acting as an insulator. It's like you put a blanket on the lake. And so in effect, it keeps the lake warmer than it otherwise would be. Now this might sound a little bit bizarre, like ice keeps you warm. <laughs> if you're evaporating, the answer is yes. It's sort of like snow, snow can be an insulator, right? So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but once you've got ice, it has a tendency to then shut off all that heat loss process that created the ice in the first place. <laughs> so it, it sort of offsets itself, but it also does something else. It reflects sunlight, it's a white surface. So think of like putting on an ice blanket to keep you warm, well, in the wintertime, if you were doing that as a person, you'd rather have it be a black blanket than a white blanket because black absorbs sunlight, but ice is white. So you've changed the dark water surface of the lake to a bright white ice surface. And what it does is it reduces the warming of the lake from solar radiation. So it's actually the opposite of this other one. These are two competing influences. And which one wins out actually depends on the atmospheric conditions and the time of year. So for example, this radiation effect, it's called the albedo effect. Albedo is the amount of reflectivity of the ice. It's mostly important in late spring when you potentially could still have some high ice cover, but you're also getting a lot of sunlight. And in fact, this ice albedo effect is hugely important in the Arctic because by June in the Arctic, you're getting a lot of sunlight, um, you know, day long sunlight, uh, 24 hours of sunlight, and you still have a lot of ice. So it can actually be an important effect on the Great Lakes if we have ice lingering well into um, May, let's say, which has happened. And then finally, ice does one other thing too. It actually feeds back to the atmosphere. You know, I, I talked about that ice bridge that had formed on, on our Royal. This is an, uh, a weather model output of surface air temperatures uh, just a few days ago. And you can see that there was this cold front coming through and it just surged across Thunder Bay and Isle Royal and out into Lake Superior through this land bridge that had effectively been formed by the ice. So once you get that ice out in the lake, it's it's you know allows that cold air mass to move across. I remember when I used to live in Sault Ste. Marie and when the when Whitefish Bay would freeze over, you would notice because suddenly you'd start getting these 30 below nights from cold air outbreaks that would move across 
the lake and not be affected because they were iced over. All right, so <clears throat> ice affects evaporation. We just talked about that, but it turns out that the reverse is also true. Um, evaporation affects ice. In fact, it creates ice. Ice evaporation is a heat loss process. It takes heat away and forms ice. And so ice formation requires rapid heat loss. Um, it occurs not just through evaporation, but also things known as sensible heat flux and radiation. And so when you have a high ice year, it's actually an indicator that you had strong evaporation uh, prior to the ice being formed because you need that cooling effect to create the high ice in the first place. Um, low ice years, on the other hand, indicate weak prior evaporation. All right, so it seems a little bit counterintuitive. You're like, well, low ice, and you know, I think when there's no not much ice, there's a lot of evaporation. But that's when I'm talking. You know, that's the capping effect that occurs coincidentally. What I'm talking about here is what happened before um, the ice observation. If you didn't get much ice buildup, that means you didn't have much heat loss, which means you didn't have much evaporation. Um, and I, actually, there was a, a question in advance of this webinar from one of our listeners that I thought was spot on because it, it really hits to this point. They said, with so little ice on Lake Superior this winter, why hasn't there been more lake effect snow? And it's really critical to this point here because the reason is that they're both because of the same thing, all right? So we had a, we had a low ice year. That means that there wasn't much evaporation to lead to cooling. If there wasn't much evaporation, we aren't gonna get much lake effect snow. All right, so the fact that, that there was so little ice um, was a reflection of the fact that there wasn't much evaporation, which also creates lake effect snow in the first place. So really, really great question. And I imagine there'll be some more um, later on as well, but this really relates to this point here. Um, and I, I'm not gonna dwell a lot of time on this graph. There's a couple of these that a former student of mine made for those of you who are interested in correlation analyses, she, she basically um, took ice cover data for Lake Superior and correlated it with evaporation before and after the onset of the ice cover and found a really interesting pattern that basically proves what I was just talking about. This is in her thesis, uh, University of Nebraska 2012. But what she found basically is that when you had high ice during this ice covered period, um, in January, February, March, that means you had high evaporation beforehand, all right? So lots of cooling led to the ice cover in the first place. But then interestingly, you had low evaporation later on. And so the effect during the ice cover period wasn't that dramatic. It's the before and after that was dramatic and they kind of cancel each other out, all right? So ice is the result of evaporation before it. And because of all the ice that happened during the winter and the cold winter we had, it had a negative effect on evaporation later in the summer. And the reason that happened was because of temperature. She so did a similar analysis with, with water surface temperatures and found a big correlation between um, the amount of ice you have in the winter and um, the temperature of the lake itself. And this has been found by others as well. So it was basically verifying that and finding really no correlation with autumn water temperatures, which are largely gonna be driven by what the, the meteorology is. So. Um, interesting correlation there. And what, what are we learning from all this is that, that evaporation and ice cover have complex interacting feedbacks through the atmosphere and the water surface. Um, ice and evaporation interact strongly through water temperature. Ice also directly affects evaporation through that capping process I talked about. And all of these interact with the atmosphere. So if we were to summarize this in terms of you know, comparing it to the old paradigm, the old paradigm was that ice simply acts as a cap on winter evaporation. So let's say you have, you know, fall going into winter and then spring here. In a low ice year, this is what you might typically expect. Um, not much ice in the wintertime, so you got all this evaporation going on, nothing, well, there's ice cover. And then in a high ice year, it just caps all that off and you get less evaporation. That is pretty much probably what more than 50% of the general public thinks is what's going on. You'll still see this in some of the newspaper articles that talk about it. And it turns out that, that it's, it's really a vast oversimplification. And what's really going on is these complex interactions I talked about before. So in a low ice year, in order to get that low ice 
in the first place, you need less heat loss. A lot of that, in fact, most of that heat loss comes through evaporation. And so that means you had less evaporation to lead to less ice cover. And then once that ice came off early, you allowed the lake to warm up. And after that, you get the high evaporation. All right, so it's a, it's a seasonal shift that, that goes on here. And then in a high ice year, you need high evaporation to get the high ice cover in the first place. So even though there's a lot of ice cover that winter, it's an indication that a lot of evaporation happened before then to make it occur in the first place. And then in the summer, the lingering effects of winter keep the water temperatures colder and evaporation is less. So, you know, you really have to look at the full annual cycle to figure out which one wins out when it comes to these effects of evaporation. And, and not one year can, is necessarily going to be exactly the same as the next in terms of these effects either. Um, and then finally here, I'll just mention that at Standard Rock Lighthouse, where we have some of these evaporation measurements, Chris Spence wrote a, a paper on this in 2013 and noted that during the 2010 um, 2010 summer, which was following a low ice year, um, we had significant earlier start to the evaporation season, such that by the time we got to the end of the year, we had 10 inches of additional evaporation from Lake Superior as a result of that low ice winter. So the effects can be seen, but they weren't really seen until the start of the following summer. All right, so it's important to notice those, those seasonal differences. All right, finally, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here with some water level implications. I know we're, we're, we don't have a ton of time, but we'll have some questions later and, and uh, Greg and Jack will be talking about some of the ice cover impacts. So I just wanna talk a little bit about water levels. All right, so water budgets are complex too. I was showing you the, the energy balance previously, but you know, how much heating and cooling goes on, how does that affect the water temperatures? I showed this graph previously which shows the Lake Superior water balance. Evaporation in itself is pretty complex as we've already discussed, but on top of that, you've got to deal with precipitation, runoff coming from streams. Uh, if you're talking about some of the lower lakes, they have inflow and outflow from the upper and the lower lakes that has to be accounted for. So water budgets are, are really even more complicated than evaporation itself. There's still lots of missing data. This is the graph I showed previously. If you're trying to do a water balance for Lake Superior, there's you know a lot of missing rain gauges. There's a lot of missing stream gauges. We, we don't really have a full um, water balance to do an accurate accounting. That being said, we do know that the lakes vary a lot. So this is the annual mean lake levels for Lake Superior. And I'm also showing Michigan here on. And this is for the, as far back as the records go, which started around 1860. And you can see a lot of variability for Lake Superior. The max min range is about 2.6 feet. It's about double that for Lake Michigan here on. Um, we have flirted with record highs and lows many times. Um, there's a lot of decadal variability. And you know, for the most part, it's related to precipitation. That's, that's the elephant in the room when it comes to the water balance is how much rainfall and snowfall we get really drives the lakes and it's uh, modulated by the effects of evaporation and others. So what about this past winter? Well, the 2020-21 winter is sort of what I'm calling a tale of three winters. <laughs> and I know the month of October isn't really winter, that's still the middle of, of autumn, but here's the first winter we had. This is the mean temperature departures from average, and you can see much below normal temperatures for October. I know when we were up here in the UP still doing boat work on Lake Superior. And, and it was like, you know, people are saying, oh, winter is, has hit. But we get we get falls like this fairly often, it seems. I, I do a fair amount of buoy work on the Great Lakes. And it seems like we're always getting antsy when October hits because you get a snowstorm and suddenly you think, oh, winter is really going to hit with a vengeance. And then suddenly November is warm and December was warm and January was warm. They were all above normal, some really above normal temperatures for the northern U.S. in, in January. And so it's, you know, we kind of got faked out by October thinking it was going to be a, a long cold winter like the polar vortex winter, and it wasn't, but then February came. Um, I don't have a map from NOAA yet for the month of, of February, but this was a, a weather forecast output for 
oh, when was this? Fe February 16th. So middle of February, this is the you know disruption of the polar vortex and the big cold wave that hit down well into Texas and caused the disruption of the power grid there. But these are you know 35, 30 to, to 40 below normal temperatures on uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, if you average over a month, of course, it, it's going to ameliorate a bit, but, but we're going to see definitely below normal temperatures for February. So it was kind of a weird winter in that sense. It's not like that hasn't happened before, but, but it makes it interesting. And if you look at the ice cover this winter, and now I'm comparing Lake Superior to Lake Erie, just so you can see what um, a, a, the deepest lake compared to the most shallow lake looks like. And I'm looking at um, two different years here. I picked this winter, obviously, but then also a much higher icier winter, not quite the polar vortex one, but the year after that, which was 2014, 15. And you can see what, you know, what happened this year is we didn't get much building of ice cover because we didn't have much cold air outbreaks. We, we didn't have much evaporation to cause a lot of cooling. And we didn't have a lot of lake effect snow either. And then, and then mid-February hit and the ice cover built like mad. Um, it built so rapidly that it really was quite thin. We got some windy events and then, you know, it, it broke up the ice cover and now things are actually starting to warm up again. So as, as one of my weather service friends in Marquette said to me yesterday, well, you can put a, you can put a pin in it, <laughs> put a pin in this winter. It's pretty much over uh, because the, the forecast now in the long term is really a warm up um, and even warmer than average. Now, comparing to those the previous year, you can see, not the previous year, but this, this previous uh, high ice year, you can see that some significant deviations from this blue line, which is the average. So it gives you some idea of the year to year variability you might see in these lakes. And Erie had a similar temporal pattern. You know, it had that spike of high ice cover and then it dropped below normal pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but you can see that it gets much more extensive ice cover than Superior as well, because it's even though it's more southern, it's quite a bit shallower and cools off faster. So uh, just very quickly to wrap up here, I want to you know just mention that spring is the this is what I call the season of sun versus ice. These are all images from spring over various uh, years. This is the Granite Island webcam again. You can see some ice. Um, trying to form or getting broken up and then having some open water patches. This is a lake effect snow event, so it's cold, dry air, but you can see the lake is getting these, these thaw ponds, you might call them. And so it's a competition. It's a competition between the sun trying to, sun and wind trying to break up the ice and occasional bursts of cold air trying to keep the ice on the lake. You also get patterns like this where you see lake effect snow coming off Lake Superior, but you also get what I might just, I call this land effect snow. <laughs> I mean, the, the land gets heated up quite a bit because it's, it's getting darker because a lot of the snow is melting and the sun is heating it up. And so these lake effect streamers just continue. They continue out onto the land. You get these convection cells that set up and you start to lose that distinction between lake and land as, as we move into spring. Um, spring is the season of melt too. Quite coincidentally, it lines up right with that uh, peak of average ice cover on Lake Superior. We peaked a little early this year because we had that cold wave and then the wind break up. But on average, first day of spring is when you know we start to lose our snow and ice up here. Um, speaking of snow, here's the snow water equivalent currently on the ground right now. Well, this is the first day of spring, March 1st of this year. And these are inches of water. So, you know, we're talking about these some bright pinks here, 10 to 20 inches of water that's sitting on the ground. Um, that's not snow depth, that's snow, snow water equivalent. So if you were to melt it down, that's how much water is on the, on the land surface, ready to run off into Lake Superior and fill up the lake, you know, a little bit higher, and then it runs down into lower lakes. But if you compare to the 2015 winter, 2015 spring, it was, there was quite a bit more snow back then. So you know, we, we've got plenty of snow now this year, but it's lower than normal though, and it's lower than this year. So not like there's going to be a huge anomalously high impulse of, of water from that snow melt. There is some potential for a warmer, warmer summer water temperatures and early evaporation. These are, this is a graph of all the different lake surface, mean lake surface temperatures for Lake Superior from 95 to 2020 from the NOAA Great Lakes Lab. 
And you can, they've also highlighted here the, the warmest year on that record and then the coldest year. And the warmest in this case was 2012. And that was kind of a bizarre spring. We had a really warm March. We had some 80 degree temperatures up in the UP at some point. Rapid snow melt, um, the lake stratified earlier and, and you had a really um, warmer surface temperatures early in the summer that led to an early start to the evaporation season. This is where we are right now. We are actually, we were matching 2012 for a while and then February hit and we built all that ice and cooled off the lake. And now we're sort of fair to Midland, you know, just right in the middle of that pack. And it depends on how things, how this trajectory goes, but there is a forecast for above normal temperatures in the coming weeks. So we might, you know, we might push some warmer temperatures this summer, which would lead to slightly higher evaporation rates earlier in the year. Here's the temperature and precipitation outlook from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. I'm just gonna put out a few other resources that you guys can go to if you wanna check these out. The one month outlook is actually showing pretty warm temperatures for our region. The three month, you start to lose some predictability, but um, there is still an, a La Nina going on and, and some of the patterns for that are, are more robust than if we didn't have anything going on in terms of El Nino or La Nina. There is a forecast for a slight chance of above normal precipitation in the coming three months, which you know doesn't bode well for lake levels, but maybe some of that higher evaporation will offset it. And then finally, um, if you really want you know, some good six month lead time forecasts for Great Lakes water levels, I suggest you go both to the NOAA lab, but also the US Army Corps of Engineers or USACE uh, websites. They, they provide some of these long range outlooks um, as well as data going back a couple of years. And you can see for Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario here, the blue is the average, the red is where we, we've been. Um, you know, it looks like Superior is gonna sort of come back closer to normal, but still the, the window of uncertainty in the next six months places it um, slightly above normal. Lake Michigan, Huron is gonna continue to be high um, unless, you know, things really dry out this summer. Um, Erie will continue to be high. Ontario, fortunately, has come down quite a bit. I know they did increase some of the outflow there at the dam, and that's helped ameliorate some of those issues with high water levels previously. So that's all I had. I, um, sorry if I went over a little bit. I just want to, you know, wrap up with this slide and reminder of the things we know and the things we don't know. And, you know, as scientists, we need to be careful about making forecasts sometimes because there are a lot of uncertainties in the science that we're doing. We need to be clear about that. Just some acknowledgements, um, same one I showed previously, thanks to all these folks that have contributed and uh, happy to take any questions if there are some now or we can do it later as well, Mark. Thanks, John, uh, fascinating talk. And uh, I'm gonna ask you a fairly simple one and we got a couple other, a little bit more complicated questions we may uh, tag for later, but the simpler question is on your water balance chart you showed it a couple times on lake superior you compared it with uh, niagara falls uh -huh. and the question was what's the period of time you know is that uh continuously across a month or what's the uh kind of the the yeah there? sure that um that's a good question um particularly since i do get that question i think almost every time i put this slide up and it reminds me that i don't probably explain it as well as I should. Um, the, Ni it's, the Niagara Falls, is a f it's a flux of water. So it's, it's the amount of water per unit time. So whether it's cubic meters per second, cubic feet per second, centimeters per month over the area of Lake Superior, it's already got the time built into it. So it's, it's whatever unit of time you want, but you have to then do the volumetric conversion to get it in the right units. So you can think of this as, you know, whatever the, however many cubic meters of water are coming out of Niagara Falls every second, that's what's leaving Lake Superior every second in December. It's essentially like, it's almost as if you took instead of you know, having evaporation coming off the lake surface, surface, it's like you added two Niagara Falls to the St. Mary's River. All right, so it's a, it's a flux of water per unit time. Um, it's like you just turned on a faucet and it's flowing at the same rate as the Niagara River. I hope that helps. 
that very that helps very much very much so thanks again um we are going to switch to um our next uh, uh speakers and let me introduce the team from edgewater resources um they are located both in uh, St. Joseph, Michigan, their headquarters, and in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, the team there is going to help us understand ice impacts at community shorelines and marinas. So we're really pleased to have uh, Jack Cox, professional engineer. He's the director of engineering at Edgewater Resources. Jack has over 45 years of experience in marine engineering. He's the only PE in the Great Lakes who is triple board certified in port coastal and navigation engineering. And then joining Jack for the program today is Greg Waycamp. Greg's a director of design and also the firm president. Greg has over 25 years of experience in marinas and waterfront park design. He's also a lead certified landscape architect. And I think with that, we would just like to see if we can uh, start sharing the slides and turn the program over to Jack and Greg. And uh, thank you so much for participating today. Very good. Well, well, John did a great job by telling us what happens as we do or don't grow ice. Now, what we're going to talk about is what happens if we do or do not have ice. Now, we got, we're going to walk through the physical and engineering implications of all that. So the first thing we'd like to talk about is ice behavior and, and what it actually triggers. So Ice can do a, a whole variety of things to us. Uh, the kinds of damage that can happen, there could be uh, what's called con compression and expansion damage. That's a situation where if you get ice growing in a confined space, uh, it starts actually expanding and the process of expansion can uh, buckle walls, push them out, break things. Um, it, you could get a similar kind of effect with ice jacking that is a phenomenon that when ice grows around a structure or a, a pile or something like that, because of uh, fluctuations up and down of the water level, that ice can actually physically lift a pile or, or a stone or something off the bottom and suspend it in the air. Um, in the horizontal, we can find ice being pushed by the wind. Uh, we're going to talk in much more detail about that. Uh, we can actually have just the sheer physical weight of ice. If you've all seen images, and we'll show you some here, of massive piles of ice. And you can imagine if you start placing that against a structure, just that, that sheer, sheer force of, of weight has the ability to crush or deform um, your facility. On the, on the coastal side, ice shove is a big problem because ice can actually make its way uh, onto shore and, and causes damage. But on the flip side, on those years, as, as John talked about, where we don't have ice, we may still have very uh, exposed shorelines. And historically, winter, when we think we would have ice, is a time of, of more intense storms. So a lack of ice can be deleterious for it in the fact that it invites more coastal erosion, more coastal damage. And then all these things trickle down into what happens to your facility, whether you have a marina, a pier, uh, waterfront structure, whatever. But interestingly enough, anything and everything that ice does is a is related to some physical property of the ice. Ice strength, which is what everything is built around, is a function of the temperature of the ice and the purity of the ice. Purity meaning um, in, in some places, if we're in the coastal or near coastal waters, there may be some salt. In other cases, we may have other contaminants. We may have suspended sediments. All of those go to how the crystals of ice grow together and bond together. I want you to think about uh, a sheet of ice for a minute as the same as a sheet of glass. Now, you may or may not be aware that glass, even though we drop a glass, pane of glass, and we see it shatter all the time, a glass, a glass is actually exceedingly strong in compression. In fact, uh, ocean-going submersibles actually use spheres of glass without any other reinforcing to resist the heavy pressures of the ocean. So, so glass can be extremely strong in compression, and so can ice. On the other hand, ice is extremely weak in what we call flexure, which is, is the bending of ice. It takes very little bending of a sheet 
uh, for glass to break or for ice to break. And we have a, there's a sensitivity in, in the uh, ice relative to its thickness compared to the structure itself. So we, we need to think about is, is something a very slender structure that's being acted on by ice versus something that's very fat or, or linear like a wall, because that goes to how those ice crystals in the ice actually will break. And that's related to then the force that the ice sheet can or cannot put against a structure. A, 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 another aspect of ice is if it actually gets moving very fast, whether it's being driven by a current or driven by the wind, its apparent strength can grow by a factor of two or three. So just by saying you have a piece of ice of a certain strength, that's not the whole side of the story. It's a function of how fast that, that piece of ice hits you. Uh, maybe, maybe a comparison on that is if you take your hand and you slap it against the surface of water, it hurts. You can push your hand into a surface of water and feel no pain. But if you smack it very fast, it hurts. And that's because it's, it's what we call strain rate and ice becomes stronger that way. The final thing that we need to be aware of is that ice does break up into pieces, but all those pieces kind of act together in a, I don't want to use the word system, but a, as, a, as a family and they can clump together and bind together and they end up creating a much bigger uh, a floating thing, floating mass than an individual flow. So that, that uh, broken ice pieces, if they come at you, actually can exert a much greater force than just a single ice flow might. Now, so I've used the word ice flow, and ice flow is basically a, a pancake of ice of some given dimension. Now, there are actually some practical limitations to how big those ice flows can get. And it is a function of what we call the flexural strength of the ice. In this table that you're looking at here, this is an example of an ice sheet that has grown to about three feet thick. Now, if the ice is weak in flexure and it has a, a strength of 50 PSI, and that's something that we would see in a late spring as things are breaking up, we might be able to sustain the biggest flow of ice at something around the size of uh, six meters, which is about 20 feet in diameter. On the other hand, uh, in the middle of winter, you, you might be up in the 30 to 40 foot diameter range of ice flows. Here, here's an example of pictures of, of uh, ice that has broken up. It's actually moving down the stream. Some of those flows in this particular case may be approaching 50, 60, 70 feet in diameter. And that again is a function of the strength of the ice and the, uh, the thickness of the ice, but you can get a whole mixture of ice sizes in there as things are being, as the ice flows themselves are banging against each other and keep breaking up. But there is a kind of a practical maximum limit to the size of the ice. Again, a function of the strength of the ice and the temperature of the ice. But what can happen is if you have this big mix of ice flows coming down a stream, or maybe it's trying to squeeze its way inside between two harbor jetties or breakwater heads, there is a point at which, because the ice pieces are so constant, they can't all squeeze through there. And what they end up doing is, is what we call arching. They actually form a, a dam across the entrance. And once that dam is formed, no more ice flows through it and more and more ice just begins to pile up against it. So suddenly we are no longer faced with just what is the impact of the force of a of an ice flow hitting a pile or something like that, but rather what is the force being applied by maybe a, a, a field of ice that's a half a mile wide and, and a foot deep pushing against our structure. So, so we need to be very sensitive to what is the spacing between structures. This gets down to something even as simple as if we're planning for piers that have to survive through the winter, we can't let the, the supporting pile columns be too close together or ice will accumulate around them, pile up, and actually create much greater force that won't work, won't, we won't be able to support. Typically, we would like to have a spacing of, a, of our piles or the opening of a marina or anything similar to that to at least be four times the flow diameter. Now, I've said a flow diameter might be in the range of uh, uh, 30 feet to maybe 50 feet. So depending upon what your situation is, you might be looking at wanting to have open spans of 100 feet or more in order to avoid something like this happening. 
Here, here in fact, is exactly an example of, of an ice jam formation. You can see the large ice flows have occurred in there. All of those are trying to squeeze into this very narrow opening of a river, and it's actually caused all the ice to pile up and accumulate in one place. And that's simply because there are too many of the large pieces that clump together and won't let any more ice pass through. Now, as ice is moving, particularly if it reaches a shoreline, there's not a lot that can stop it. Now, we have a, a movable object here. It's, a, it's got a lot of force being pushed against it. The ice will just try to continue to march up on the shore, and it will march until there's enough friction or something gets in its way that causes it to stop, and then the ice starts piling up, much as kind of is illustrated in these pictures. How much it marches on shore is very much a, a function of, of how smooth the shoreline is, whether there's obstacles in its way, what those obstacles are. In the next uh, slide, I think we'll see an actual video of this sort of thing happening. Here we're looking at an ice sheet that's uh, two to three feet thick. This is actually crawling up on shore right across somebody's lawn. And we're going to see that even though this is, it looks like a bunch of jumbled small pieces, and it is because it's grinding, it's not being stopped in any way by uh, uh, the fact that we have a nice lawn. In fact, that's great lubricant for the ice. It can, can continue to march, and it's well documented that some of this can march oh, tens of feet to hundreds of feet and sometimes take out a building. We've actually studied this in the laboratory as well. Here's a case of a, a sheet of ice kind of encountering a, an island or a curved piece of shoreline. If the surface is smooth relative uh, to the, the ice thickness, so it's, it's a very thin thing, the ice will actually, even though it's breaking, and you can in the lower bottom right-hand corner, the picture you can see all the little fractures in the ice, this will just crawl right up the slope and continue on going, even though that the slope of the uh, island itself maybe tens of feet above the lake level itself. It just continues to move as a sheet and, and with nothing to stop it. So, so these moving structures now are gonna be applying some forces on our, uh, um, our structures. Seems like we're missing a table there. Greg, if you can click on that, see if that pops in. Ah, good. Uh, what we find is that if you have a vertical structure, as ice pushes against it, uh, it can have some very strong pressures applied against it, up to 400 PSI uh, if it's the middle of the winter. And typically, things on the Great Lakes are designed assuming a, a nominal 200 to 250 PSI crushing strength. I will tell you that's a large number and very difficult to resist. However, if we do some geometric adjustment to our structure, put a little slope on its front face, make it be more round rather than cylindrical, you can see that we can actually reduce the force applied to our structure from uh, as much as, well, we've got a, a rake at 75 degrees in the bottom left-hand corner for a very slender uh, a barrier like you're seeing in the picture, it reduces at 20%. That would be the reduction to 0.79. On the other hand, if we make it very fat and we flatten the angle even more, we can take our force all the way down to 15% of what the crushing strength is. So when we design something for ice, different than designing it for waves or currents, we want to be very sensitive and actually introduce some of these sloping geometric forms in order to reduce the amount of force that we have to uh, absorb in our structure. I'll, I'll point out, um, keep this shape in mind uh, as we show some uh, physical examples later in the presentation. So just notice that shape, you'll see it come back. So here, here's an example of uh, just a, a very simple pier out into a lake. Uh, you can see the full ice cover uh, just beyond the pier itself. Normally what we'd be seeing there are vertical piles. They would be uh, steel piles. But what has been added are conical skirts. Those conical skirts create that wedge sort of shape that we looked at in the previous example. 
And that was a way of reducing the force on the piles that would be experiencing this crushing load, this pushing load, by as much as 50 or 60 percent that allowed for the use of smaller piles um, and, and made this thing a much more affordable and practical solution. Here, as we look at other shoreline type protections, in the top left-hand corner, you're looking at, at a simple slope that could be a revetment or could be any, any number of things, but something that's very rough. The, the middle structure is saying, well, if, if my uh, simple structure does not work as well as I want, maybe I want to try and make ice break sooner. And so there's an introduction of what we call a bench that we put close to the water line. That feature right there is intended to first cause the ice to ride up, bend and break on itself and actually accumulates ice there so that it won't climb up further. And in the bottom left hand is really the ultimate. It's not only a bench, but physical ice breaking structures, little triangles very similar to what we just looked at are there to cause a three dimensional breaking the ice and prevent ice from riding up any further. What we have learned over time is that in order to stop ice from climbing up a slope, we need to make the roughness on the slope be at least as thick as the, as the thickest ice sheet that we ever expect to have happen. If we can use, I'm gonna say very large rocks, let's, let's say we have an, an ice thickness of, of two feet. We would want to have rocks of at least four foot in diameter in order to prevent ice from riding up and instead start rubbling and accumulating lakeward of our structure. That would be a way of protecting ourselves. Here, here's an example again of a uh, ice right up. Now here, here actually is a wall. You can see that the, the wall, things are coming over the top of the wall, but in fact, no longer is the sheet advancing on land. It's accumulating the ice right against the wall. Now we still want to leave adequate reservoir because there's a lot of ice moving here, but now we are, we, anything that we have, whether it's buildings, roads or whatever behind that is, is in a protected zone because we have, have forced and controlled rubbling, which is what we want to do. And this is all happening in this image in, re, in real time. Now, just uh, some additional subtleties as we have studied this, it even turns out that the performance of such a wall is very dependent on its geometry. In the bottom right hand picture are examples of two different walls, one which was built vertical and one which was built with a slight angle back to the lake. Very much like the uh, image in the top left hand corner, which is a parapet wall for protecting from wave over topping. What we find is that by creating a structure that has a, a batter, what we call a batter or sloping uh, face towards the lake, it is much more effective at pushing the ice back just as it is at pushing the waves back than if you just go vertical because the vertical piles up in the video that we just saw. And, and there's some realities that we still have to face. Uh, in any design, we have to estimate how much ice are we prepared to defend against? And in doing so, we have to set aside sufficient, what I'm calling reservoir room, to al allow that ice to accumulate and not reach back to our buildings, our homes, or into our marina. If you don't have sufficient reservoir room to cause the ice to pile up, it will continue to advance and be a problem. Again, if you don't have the rocks big enough, uh, we can actually see the ice sheet plucking those rocks off an armored face and carrying them with them. So, so we need to be sensitive again to uh, uh, the size of rock relative to the size of ice. There are no formulas for sizing rock and ice as there are for sizing rocks and waves, but we understand that it needs to be at least twice the thickness of the ice in order to be, have any effect at all. Well, I, I hope to not make you seasick here, but I'm going to try to take uh, everything that the previous two speakers have talked about and kind of talk about some uh, you know, physical application of these things uh, in, in some pictures and projects here. Uh, this is uh, the view from the South Pier in St. Joseph, Michigan, uh, about two hours ago.
And uh, you'll see the same view about a week ago. And it's quite interesting to see how quickly the ice can change. So um, anyway, lots of ice, beautiful day down here. So um, when we think about all these issues, um, you know, as we talk about ice shove, it's a nearly irresistible force. And this is a great example. Um, when you think about some of the really dynamic things Jack was showing, when you see that, you know, the ice moving very quickly and being pushed up, this is simply a, a sheet of ice. This is on the south side of, um, oh shoot, which island? It's, in the, it's, in, it's near Putin Bay um, uh, and in the, uh, near Sandusky and the south end of Lake Erie. And um, this is just a massive sheet of ice moving. So I want you to keep your eye on the end of this structure. And it's just literally being pushed away. It's the irresistible force meeting what was thought to be an immovable object, which it clearly is not. And so the idea here is, you know, we're often asked, you know, when we're building structures and engineering structures, this is Kelly's Island. I'm sorry, I don't know why space on the Kelly's Island there. Um, is, you know, it's a million tons of ice or some, some unfathomable weight of ice being moved at maybe a tenth of a knot. Um, but that force is going to continue on. And I'm sure Jack's got a formula. He could tell you what that, what that equates to, but it's a lot. Um, and obviously we need to try to design structures that can resist that. And one of the things you'll notice right here, that's a vertical face. And as Jack pointed out earlier, when you have a vertical face being attacked by something like that, um, in this case, it's a crib structure laying on the bottom, so it's not pinned in nearly as much as some other types of structures, and it can just be pushed out of the way. So I am going to look at some other options here. We spent, um, here at Edgewater Resources, have spent a lot of time over the last uh, 12 months um, helping communities deal with, communities and homeowners deal with shoreline protection and shoreline systems. This is also in St. Joseph, Michigan, and this was uh, an old rubble. Uh, protection structure here that at, at the originally was just buried under the sand. Nobody really knew this was here until the water levels came up and the beach used to be out here about where that first wave break is and that was all exposed and you can see the all the storming happening here um, was put in over the summer. You know this is a scenario here where you know not even a particularly uh, large storm here but you can see with a lack of ice cover this this photo let me turn that sound on this photo or this video was taken probably a month ago. And obviously when we have ice cover, uh, you don't even need this armoring because we have natural armoring. So this is what it looked like last week. Um, and of course that's the same space and same place. And of course, with all this ice, I don't worry about a little storm like that because all of that ice cover is gonna protect my shoreline. So one of the biggest uh, impacts we've had in the last uh, 12 to 18 months is the lack of ice cover combined with the high water levels has really allowed the wave attack to attack that shoreline in a way that it hasn't in the past and caused tremendous erosion, tremendous issues. And, and you know, a lot of, uh, you know, I'll call it panic armoring. And, and I don't blame people. You need to armor structures and armor and protect your shoreline, but it's really a, a combination of high water and no ice during these higher winter storms has really created an issue. So that's when we talk about a lack of ice, that's a big deal there. We had to invest a lot of money and some of these other structures to make this work. Uh, this is from literally just 10 days ago. This is that same view from the first video I just showed you. That was all of our ice here. Again, relatively thin ice, as John pointed out, it came on quickly. So rather than the big massive ice, we had lots of relatively thin, that's two to three inches thick, these plates here. And that's all, has, has all melted for the most part. Um, you know, back to the shoreline protection. This is uh, South Haven, Michigan. Um, and this is a scenario where one of the, one of the stretches of, of shoreline that is, is not armored, and this is a community uh, that has really recognized the value of, of a soft shoreline and um, took a very progressive and proactive approach to just say, hey, you know what, we need to recognize that our beach is going to move in and out, and we would rather allow that to happen and some years have a smaller beach. You can see it's quite small this year. This is in the summer of 2018. Um, in other years, it's a bigger beach. Um, but what has happened over the last year, I want you to notice this home right here, this blue house. I want you to notice all of that shoreline out in front of it. Now I want you to see what that looks like today. And all of that, all of that shoreline eroded away in about um, one season. And so in fact, all of this rock was just placed uh, from last December uh, to protect it. So previously, that, there's a little bit of rock that was tucked in here when the home was built. 
and they've lost all of this. And so at this point, the community has started to get a little bit nervous. And so we're hoping that uh, we've been fortunate that we didn't uh, lose anything more this year. And you can't see it in this image, but one of the reasons we, we this line stopped here is very low. There was a very, very old steel sheet pile section that was placed here and no one knows where it came from. It was there, who knows, 50 years ago. And it was exposed and just that tiny little bit held the toe to prevent this from collapsing. So, but that's a big deal. When we think about the impacts of, of, of high water levels and natural erosion, you need to be flexible and the community uh, has gotten real nervous. Now we're all hoping of course that it will, water levels will go down and this will accrete, but we need to respond to these issues. And, and this rock here presents its own set of issues um, that'll, that'll cause erosion and other issues to be dealt with there. Uh, this is a little bit further up the shoreline in Douglas, Michigan. And this is uh, Douglas Beach, which actually starts from this steel sheet pile wall and goes down to about here. It's about 200 feet. And it's a little tough to see in this image, but they're also getting a lot of erosion. You know, this beach in a, in a you know, maybe five years ago, this beach was way, way out here, a much bigger beach. Now, of course, it's quite small with the high water levels. And they're facing a lot of erosion here. And this is a relatively steep bluff with uh, clay and fissures and it's starting to collapse into the lake and they've asked us to help them protect this. And one of the things that we really wanted to avoid was putting in that rock. The community doesn't wanna have the rock, but we did need to come up with something that would allow us to protect it on a temporary basis. So there's a different series of strategies here that were used to the north, you know, looking here northward, uh, they came in and, and, and placed a bunch more rock. And this was actually placed uh, relatively late in the season as the water levels receded. What the, what the city of Douglas did is, is they chose to come in with geotubes in this area. And you can see the erosion a bit better here with the idea that uh, the hope is that we can protect this shoreline um, in the near term uh, from, the, from the potential risk of erosion this, this winter. And then uh, over time, as the water levels go down, we can take this out. We're looking at some other offshore structures that would also help protect this and, and potentially um, trip the ice and do some other things that would, would help protect the shoreline without losing that soft edge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can see they lost what was left of that staircase that we showed in the earlier image. That staircase here uh, was lost uh, in just a month or so. That was a big collapse there. Uh, this is Tawas, East Tawas, Michigan. And again, when we think about shoreline edges and preparing for ice damage, you know, this is a soft natural shoreline that allows that ice to move up. Um, and when, and you know, and that, that works great when you've got some distance. And of course, we're always encouraging folks to build farther back from the shoreline. But of course, uh, this is back in St. Joseph. You have many homes that are built very close to the water and then you really only have one strategy here. Um, and this has its own set of issues and you can see the old groins and so forth. But all of these shoreline edge conditions are there because there was no hope of, of having ice in place to protect it. And of course, when it's this close, we need these structures to protect everything else from ice. But if you saw some of that run up, uh, you can see these are so close, they're very, very likely to get hit by ice. So that's, that's a, a challenge. And when we design these structures, we didn't design this particular one, um, but that gets the roughness that Jack was describing about how do you create space? You'll notice there's no bench here. Had there been a bench here, that would have created a space for that ice to collapse before it gets up into the, into the decks and turns the homes. Um, so remember I mentioned earlier, I wanted you to remember that shape. This is at 31st Street Harbor in Chicago. Uh, it's a, a thousand slip marina uh, we designed for the city of Chicago back in, in 2010. And this whole entire end of the structure here, just to give you a sense of scale, um, that breakwater is 17 feet above the water. So that line of red stone there is 17 feet above the water and it is designed to resist uh, 35 foot waves from a 300 mile fetch out, to the, out of the north. And those stones that you see there, those are a double layer of stones that are about six foot diameter. Uh, They're absolutely enormous, but all of the structure that you see here, the design of this, uh, which we think is a, a relatively beautiful public space, is also very much designed to resist and deflect and push that ice up. These blocks here that look to be like so little benches are actually there to as a place to disperse wave energy, ice energy, and to protect everything behind it. And so a lot of this, you can see some of those shapes that were described there earlier. 
So this is along the shorelines of uh, Eastern Lake Erie um, in the town of Hamburg, just south of Buffalo. And this is a, a collection of homes um, that have over time all built a, a really interesting diverse collection of walls. You can see sometimes here they've got recurves, sometimes they're just vertical, uh, a lot of different structures here. Fortunately, at this end of the lake, they have managed to get enough ice that this has been protected more by the ice by anything else. But you can see a lot of these different strategies have been employed over the years. Um, when we talked earlier about um, managing shoreline protection, one of the issues we have on the Great Lakes, or at least in Michigan in particular, is we, we don't have many options in terms of shoreline protection beyond you know, steel and rock, basically, uh, and beach nourishment. And beach nourishment is a challenge in terms of expense. But one of the things that we're looking at and exploring and, and with Jack and his team is to really explore different strategies for you know, segmented offshore breakwaters that are smaller. In this case, you can see this particular set of structures is designed to direct sediments from the intercoastal waterway away from this basin. We can use those same techniques to direct sediments in, in beach nourishment back onto the beach uh, to help create and nourish, create those benches, create room for the ice to accumulate, protect the shoreline and have less armoring and have that soft shoreline back in place. So this is just an example of, of, of some ideas of where we're headed and here's some different strategies and modeling that shows how that came to be. Uh, Jack uh, Cox uh, led all of this design effort uh, previously um, to make this come to pass. And it's been uh, really recognized as kind of really the next, this is the next step in the future of, of how we think about shoreline strategies and protection strategies that work with nature, they direct currents, they create habitat islands and they really soften edges. So. Um, hope to be doing more and more of this. Jack's working with the state of Illinois, Illinois Beach State Park to help them look at structures like this. But again, help with the, with the wave armoring, but it also helps to deal with how the ice gets deflected and, and tumbled and so forth. Um, so there's just some different sections of how these things happen. And, and again, you see these benches and these other uh, elements where tip, things tip over and protect the structures behind and create habitat islands behind. And, and so often when we think about marinas and harbors, this is what usually comes to mind for us. We all think about that beautiful summer day. And, you know, at least up here in the Great Lakes, this is about, you know, this is what it feels like for about 100 days a year. And then a large portion of the year, this is the same marina, it looks like this. this we're back at 31st Street again. Um, and you can see a lot of ice. This was in the winter of 2013, 2014. And um, back to that idea of compression and expansion damage, we have a lot of ice attenuation in here to keep ice down. And I'll talk about the tools we use to keep the ice down, but you can see all of these piles, these anchor piles have all been tipped over and pushed over. Even though we have uh, water space um, to allow for the expansion, we have, uh, we work very hard in the ice design to actually break up these ice sheets to create um, shear points and shear lines for that ice to break open. But we still have, it was just so excessive that winter. Um, you know, there's sometimes no matter what you do, you're not gonna beat mother nature, uh, but we do our best. Um, this is some of the results of some of the damage there, uh, you know, frames being torn apart. We'll talk a little bit more about this black coating on the piles. That's another uh, strategy to combat ice jacking is, is the adhesion of the ice to the pile structure itself. That's, that's a ultra high molecular weight coating. It's meant to be a very flexible, uh, adaptable coating that allows, um, it, it really does not allow the ice to grab hold of the pile and pull it up. Um, this is what ice jacking looks like. And as Jack pointed out earlier, what ice jacking is, is quite simply is you have a sheet of ice that, that forms and it can grab hold. You can see this here. This is a remnant of where a sheet of ice was at one point. And when it grabbed hold of that timber pile, and, and we think of, of the water level being static, this is, this is in um, uh, the west arm of the Grand Traverse Bay. Um, we think of that being static, but what's actually happened is every time it rains or, or, or the wind moves the water around as it does on the Great Lakes and we have wind set up, that water moves up and down an inch or, or a few inches and it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And if, it's, if that ice sheet has grabbed hold of that pile, it's going to literally pull that pile straight out of the ground. And that's what you're seeing here is, is that's pulled up. And, and how we combat that is we prevent to, as best we can, we prevent the ice sheet from grabbing hold of those piles. Here's some other examples. This is Mackinac Island. And in this case, the piles just got lifted up and dropped right on the, right on the ground because in here, there's very little um, uh, 
friction uh, because there's so much rock here. So one of the design standards and design criteria we use when we're designing piles and anchorage systems is, is the withdrawal resistance of the pile in the, in the, in the soil. So the geotechnical conditions and then the design of the piles and the materials themselves. And, and in this case, every year they lose some of these piles uh, as, as just the nature of the design of this particular harbor. Um, snow load, it's, as we talked earlier, snow can be very, very heavy, 12 to 24 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, heavy snowfall and drifting can overload docks and other elements. Um, there's a bad day. Uh, I'm not sure where this one is, Jack. I think this might be in Europe. <laughs> So obviously uh, overloaded these, this uh, ice storm overloaded the buoyancy of these boats. Um, but this is a marina um, here in St. Joseph, uh, the winter of 2014, um, another polar vortex year. And you can see we had four to five feet of snow on top of floating docks. These, these, uh, this crew is working to remove the weight of the snow from the floating docks because of the combination of low water levels at this time, you can see uh, that is elevation LDBD plus six. And so the weight of the snow has actually pushed the docks um, quite low, but we were already at around elevation LWD water was maybe zero. So about four and a half feet lower than it is today. Last summer, this dock elevation would have been even with this up here. So you can see a lot of weight of the snow, is something to be dealt with there. Uh, back to the structure designs. This is actually out in Idaho on, I believe this is Bear Lake or actually McCall Lake. Um, north of uh, Boise. And you can see some strategies here when they put in these steel piles. Uh, this steel pile is plenty strong to hold this, this floating dock, but that batter pile that you see in front of it is there specifically to resist ice movement. And in fact, I think on the next slide, you can actually see in some cases, they put in three batter piles with the ideas, again, creating that angle and that batter angle that deflects the ice and lifts it and allows it to spill over and that's just enough force to break up the strength of the ice sheet to protect the dock structures behind it. So, you know, when you think about how you handle icing, um, you can do either ice suppression is what we call it, or you can actually design the system to, to ice in itself. You have to work carefully with your dock manufacturers if you have a floating docks, for example, or if you engineer a fixed dock system for any type of marina or any type of heart, you know, boardwalks and park spaces and bridges and those kinds of things. Um, so when you think these things through, uh, suppression alternatives really come down to um, what we call de-icing. And so this is, uh, this is that basin I just showed you where the guys were shoveling snow from this little area here. And so it's, in this case, it's a basin with steel sheet pile walls around all sides and floating docks. One of the things that we want to maintain is an open edge. We do not want the sheet of ice to be able to grab hold of, of the walls. Then what we want to do is introduce lines where we can break up that sheet of ice in the middle and then create sort of weak points where the ice sheet itself uh, can break. And that's different designs and different strategies how we do that. Um, when you think about ice, one of the big risks with ice mitigation is, is um, you know, we keep people out of marinas in the wintertime for a reason, because if we're introducing ice suppression, we're weakening the ice. It's very important that we don't let people go on the ice because if they end up in the water, you know, it's a very dangerous situation. So this is a this is a, a real risky situation in Chicago, where they're using a bubbler system that again just simply could not keep up with the ice flow. But now you've got guys that are ice fishing, and if they decide to take a step out here, this is really quite rotten ice. It's pretty unsafe what they're doing there. So we want to avoid those things and just be cognizant of when you do ice mitigation, you want to manage very carefully how people can access uh, the sites. So what is a water circulator? It's this, it's basically an electric motor with a propeller on top in a cage and you suspend that down into the water and it keeps ice move or keeps water moving. And as, as John pointed out earlier in the presentation, you know, the water underneath a sheet of ice is, is warmer uh, than the ice itself. And uh, we pull the warmer water up from the bottom and keep that moving. And it, it, it minimizes the ability of the ice to form. And what's interesting is one of these little uh, one horse um, agitators can really open up a very large area. This is a good example of what we're trying to do, again, with a floating dock system as it relates to fixed walls, as we are particularly want to protect the areas where this is an adjustable, what we call spud pile. We want that spud pile to be able to move we want all these points of movement 
to, to have the ability to flex. And it doesn't have to be completely ice free. You can see here, so long as we have a fissure in the ice and it allows that ice to break when the force is applied, uh, that minimizes the risk of damage to our structures. And that allows us to, to hopefully have a, a longer live structure. Uh, another way to do this is what's called a bubbler system. And what's, what happens is we actually have compressors on the docks and we put uh, air hoses in the water suspended and we force air through those and bubbles come up from the bottom and the, those bubbles do the same thing as the uh, uh, circulators, uh, just in a less vigorous, less violent way. Um, what you end up with is you have a compressor on the dock, it's forcing compressed air and you can see some of the bubbles here just faintly. I'm not sure how well that's coming through in the picture, but you can see some faint bubbles here. And just those bubbles are enough to, again, it doesn't have to keep it completely ice free. It has to create a weak zone in the ice Whereas this moves with, with water movement, it breaks free and, and does not allow that sheet of ice to grab hold of our dock structures and tear things apart. This is a relatively simple one. It's just a simple PVC pipe with a compressor that pushes it in. Uh, the one we did at 31st Street Harbor is uh, a very complicated system, a very expensive system. It has a weighted, a keel weighted um, uh, airline that's suspended beneath the docks. And as you can see, it pr pr promotes a tremendous amount of bubbles. And again, that's just promoting the movement of those bubbles upward, create currents that moves that warmer water up and, and just makes it harder for the ice to form. I would point out that in those earlier images I showed you where the uh, marina uh, froze in and was damaged uh, at 31st Street Harbor, uh, this system was fully active and working. So there are times when the ice is just so severe, the temperatures are so severe, that this system can be overwhelmed. And if you're gonna choose between the two, this is a more expensive system to build in the first place. But the challenge is, is if this thing goes down in the middle of winter, you're, you're not gonna cut a hole in the ice and put a diver in the water to go fix it. You're kind of out of luck. One of the nice things about this system, it's really simple, is if you need to, you cut a hole in the ice with a chainsaw, you drop this into the water and turn it on and, it, and just, you know, having cut a four by four hole in the water, this will over a, a period of hours will open up a large area of water that looks like this. And so it's a good, a good tool to use to retrofit to protect structures. Okay, so um, anchoring selection, again, uh, it's very important. This is back to this idea of, of protecting the piles with a material uh, that the ultra density high weight material that we applied originally. Uh, frankly, it failed. It was an experiment. Um, and what we ended up doing here was put, was coating these, or actually not coating, we, we ended up putting a, an HDPE pile sleeve over the top, which again is also less likely to, for the, it's less, uh, less friction. So it's harder for the ice sheet to grab hold of that. And it also allows a little bit of movement back and forth to break free between the pile itself and this outer sleeve. So that's a strategy that can be apl applied. And then ultimately, if all else fails, uh, you do as our friends in Canada do. This is a, a marina in Montreal. Um, and this marina is allowed to fully ice in. They don't do any ice attenuation at all. And what they do in the wintertime is they put these little, these little buildings in tents in some of the slips. They actually plug in these little buildings uh, into uh, the uh, dock electrical system. They're sitting right on the ice. And then they rent these out in the winter times, and guys are in there I think they're supposed to be ice fishing, but I think they're drinking beer and watching hockey is what's going on. But uh, with that, um, I'm just going to let it go and we'll just open it up for questions. Thanks so much, uh, Greg and Jack. And uh, uh, fascinating as we live here in the four seasons, what we uh, what we have to deal with. Um, there's a few questions. I know we're a few minutes after, you know, uh, one of the questions on the ice was uh, uh, maybe for Greg. Uh, do any of the ice mitigation systems around marinas have any impact on the water quality or the fish? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Those ice, those circulators are often used in the summertime to induce current, to uh, in, improve water turnover and improve water quality. Um, now, in terms of, of uh, you know, I, I haven't seen any studies that specifically state that during the winter time that they're either improving or reducing water quality, but you do see more activity from the birds and, and uh, in particular the eagles like that open water in the winter time. So, um, but definitely they are, are, are known to be a, a specific tool to improve water quality in the summertime. Great. 
again, um, uh, this is a continuous learning for all of us, myself certainly included, um, the dynamics of the Great Lakes. It's, uh, it's fascinating what we have to deal with and the design factors. I think everybody's interested in sustainability and resilience and their, and their coastlines, their marinas, their, if they're uh, located as in a housing unit along the coast. So um, lots, of, lots of different issues to, uh, to consider as we, uh, we participate here. So thanks everybody again. Uh, uh, we wish you the uh, uh, rest of the uh, a good March and uh, uneventful as the ice melts. If it melts quickly, it's typically less problems. So we'll see what, uh, what the weather brings us.